Uh, thank you, Dr. Donia, for presenting me. Today, my talk will be about maintenance immune suppressants, but from a clinical pharmacy perspective. First of all, we're going to classify immune suppressive therapy according to their mechanism of action. It could be inhibitors of cytokine gene expression as corticosteroids, or inhibitors of cytokine reduction or action like CNIs and mTORs, or inhibitors of purine and pyrimidine sensors like azathioprine and mycophenolate mofetil. The recent recommendations for maintenance immune suppression uh, in CATIGO guidelines it stated that there should be a combination of CNI plus immune uh, anti proliferative plus or minus corticosteroids according to the risk factors of the patient. Tacrolimus should be the first CNI used, and tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporine should be started before or at the time of transplantation. Mycophenolate should be the first line anti proliferative agent, and in patients who are at low immunological risk factors and who receive induction therapy, corticosteroids should be withdrawn within the first week of transplantation. If mTORs are intended to use, they shouldn't be started unless we have established graft function and surgical wounds are healed. Later on, as long-term management, we recommend lowest doses of maintenance immunosuppressive therapy, and it should be started two to, three, uh, two to four months after transplantation if there has been no acute rejection. CNI should be continued rather than withdrawn. The risk stratification, however, we have high immunological risk patients with more than 80% BRA or recipients have rejected one or more transplants aggressively within the first year of transplantation. Low immunological risk patients, however, will have a BRA below 20%, no donor-specific antibodies, and who haven't aggressively rejected previous transplant, not within the first year. Inter intermediate risk, however, will have BRA between 20 and 80% and no donor-specific antibodies. In our institute, we consider high immunological risk patients with BRA uh, above 40% and no donor-specific antibodies. This is my institute protocol. The challenge that we do face in clinical practice is to try to maintain the doses of immune suppressive agents within the therapeutic window, as high levels of the drugs will cause over immune suppression and lead to opportunistic infections and increased risk of toxicity of the drugs, like nephrotoxicity and neurotoxicity. However, low levels of the drug will cause under immune suppression and increases both uh, acute and chronic rejection. So, as a clinical pharmacist, we will utilize therapeutic drug monitoring. Why? Because of the narrow therapeutic index, high inter-individual uh, pharmacokinetics variability, and pharmaco uh, pharmacological responses are very difficult to assess or distinguish from adverse events. Timing of specimen collection is very crucial. We have to wait till the drug reaches steady state concentration to better judge its efficacy or toxicity for uh, before, uh, after dose uh, introduction or dose modification. We have to wait uh, two to three days to take samples of tacronomus and at least 10 days for serolimus. When to monitor? Whenever we make any changes in the medication on, or there is a decline in kidney function, and we can also use it to check adherence. There are several oral formulations of tacronomus. The first one was FDA approved in 1994 as immediate release tacronomus under the brand name Brograph, which is twice, uh, dosed twice daily. In 2013, there is the extended release tacronomus capsule under the brand name Astagraph XR, dosed once daily. And uh, the last one in 2015, the male dose prolonged release tacronomus dosed once daily under the brand name Invarsis XR tablets. The ASCOV study compared the pharmacokinetics profiles of the three formulations. As you can see, the prograph, the immediate release, and uh, the extended release, which is uh, astagraph, show the same characteristic high peak concentration after the oral dose, which is monitored after two hours of the dose. However, in Varsas, on the other hand, will have a delayed uh, time or prolonged time to reach the C max, which is about four to six hours, and also the C max is 30% reduced than uh, the immediate release acronyms. When we interpret this clinically, we will have we will find that it will show lower toxicities like uh, neurotoxicities as well as Brovin with uh, a certain trial. Also, uh, the ASCOV study uh, demonstrated that these changes uh, that these formulations are not interchangeable, and they provided the following do, uh, dose conversion. The main scope of our clinical practice is to check for drug-to-drug -drug interactions. 
However, how to assess and handle these interactions? Clinically significant interactions for us are the ones that are gonna change 25% in the drug level. What shall we do? The first thing is we have to monitor when the interaction is going to happen. If it happens during the first pulse, we have to make two separation of the administered two drugs. If the interaction will provide uh, severe consequences and there is no possibility of normalizing the exposure, we have to avoid this combination and to try to check for other alternatives. And also, we can use therapeutic drug monitoring as a tool to check toxicity or rejection. These drugs will cause inhibition of cytochrome system, which is responsible for the metabolism of CNIs and mTORs, resulting in higher levels and uh, endangering the patients of toxicity. And also, as you can see, cyclosporin will increase the level of mTORs, and also mTOR will increase the nephrotoxicity of cyclosporin. So this combination, in practice, is not preferable. These drugs, however, will cause induction of cytochrome system and will lead to lower levels of these drugs. It's better to avoid combination with rifampine, which is anti-tuberculosis agent, but if we have to make this combination, we will have to assess risk and benefits for the patients. These drugs will interrupt interior hepatic recirculation, which contributes to the 40% of the area under the curve of MMF uh, absorption and will lead to decreased MMF level. So uh, we try to avoid this combination, especially rifampine. And also cyclosporin or uh, cyclosporin will also lower the level of MMF. And since we don't have MMF therapeutic drug monitoring except in certain centers in Egypt, we try to closely monitor the patient for adverse events. This is Liverpool heat map uh, interaction. As you can see, the red uh, means avoid combination. This is done for the direct antiviral uh, drugs. As you can see, Curevo combination with tacrolimus will lead to an increase in tacrolimus level by 57 fold, and this combination should be avoided. Why? Because Curevo contains ritonavir, which is a potent enzyme inhibitor of cytochrome system and big lycoprotein. Also, Zibatil, when combined with azathioprine, will lead to increased toxicity and increased level of Zibatil. This table demonstrates the interaction with anti-diabetic drugs. Combination uh, with ribaclinide and cyclosporine will lead to hypoglycemia, and this is very seen in practice. Also, there is an interaction between immune suppressant and statins, as immune suppressants are inhibitors of cytochrome and by the big lycoprotein system, leading to increased levels of statin, and it may cause myalgia, myopathy, or rhabdomyosis. This combination should be used with caution, except for cyclosporin. We have provided maximum uh, doses to be used. For instance, at herbostatin, we should not exceed 10 mg, and for zofostatin, we should not exceed 5 mg. The second uh, scope of our practice is to screen for immune suppressants adverse events. As you can see from this table, most of the adverse events are seen with CNIs. When comparing cyclosporin and tacrolimus, we can see that both of them will have the same effect on kidney and, and liver. However, cyclosporin will have higher risk of hypertension and dyslipidemia. Tacrolimus, on the other hand, will have higher risk of post-transplant diabetes, neurologic toxicity. Cyclosporin will cause gingival hyperplasia, especially when combined with calcium channel blockers, and also will cause hirsutism. Tacrolimus will cause alopecia. This is the side effects of the mTOR. You can see it's responsible for the post-transplant diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, proteinuria, and anemia. The general risks of immune suppressive uh, drugs is infection, and infection is, could be life-threatening, especially of opportunistic infections, particularly herpes, viruses, pneumocytes, pneumonia, fungi, and atypical mycobacteria, and it's recommended to provide the appropriate prophylaxis for the, patient, for the risk patients. It's also uh, better to make vaccinations against uh, influenza and pneumococcus, uh, especially uh, within three to six months after transplantation. Also, we have to avoid life attenuated vaccines for the transplant and also for the close contact. When it comes to malignancy, the risk of cancer increases tremendously, especially cutaneous and hematologic malignancies. So we advise uh, to use tone protection and also to make at least yearly scan checks by a dermatologist. And also for the patients above 50 years old, we recommend fecal occult blood and cervical smears and mammography. 
Maximizing outcomes means minimizing complications of immune suppressants. As we've said before, most of the adverse events are related to CNI. So there is a new trend nowadays of CNI avoidance or CNI minimization. In our center, we do not prefer CNI withdrawal because uh, tacrolimus, uh, for instance, has been proven to have the best immune suppression. So we try to avoid CNI avoidance but we can make CNI minimization by combining with mTORs with a target level of 10. This, the patients that are going to use from, uh, are going to benefit from this combination is low to intermediate immunological risk patients and patients who are at high risk of CMV or BK viruses and patients at high risk of post-transplant malignancies as mTORs have a protective effect against viruses and malignancies. We start by uh, lowering the, by the maximum doses of CNIs and then lower it in uh, contrast to increasing the doses of mTORs. But the disadvantage of this combination is wound healing problems, especially in obese patients, and most of the risk of new onset diabetes. Immunosuppressive regimen is not a fixed thing. We can change it according to the side effects. This table lists the, max, uh, the causes of the change. For instance, we could change it according to infection. If the patient have a very severe infection, especially viruses infection, we recommend stopping all the anti-proliferative agents and probably we could reduce the dose of tacrolimus. If the patients have a life-threatening infection, we recommend stopping all the immune suppressants except for corticosteroids. Also, one of the major causes is hair loss. Hair loss, especially for female patients, could be a major complication for non adherents So we could switch from tacrolimus to cyclosporin. Also, this table demonstrates the screening time for the adverse events of the several uh, immunosuppressive agents. When it comes to immunosuppressant and fertility, when planning to conceive, we have to stop teratogenic drugs, uh, especially mTORs and inhibitors, and we have to provide a safe time for transitioning the patient into another immunosuppressant, and the female, uh, the, uh, the female patient should use contraception. Uh, and it should be based on the drug clearance time, which is five half-lives. It should be 12 weeks for the mTOR inhibitors and six weeks for MMF. When it comes to the effect on male fertility, serolimus will uh, give dose-dependent reversible alteration of sperm parameters, so the patient should be noted of this side effect. Also, uh, there was a controversy saying that MMF is teratogenic when it's used to male patients, and uh, male patients were advised to switch from MMF to azathioprine when planning to conceive, and patients uh, and uh, doctors and physicians based their arguments on the basis that there could be genetic mutations in spermatozoa, or there could be transmission of teratogenic agents in seminal fluid, leading to local exposure of the ovum and systemic maternal exposure from maternal absorption. However, Recent studies have demonstrated that the level of MMF reaching the female is 10,000 uh, 10, times lower than therapeutic levels, so it's completely safe to keep the male patients on MMF. Also, when it comes to pregnancy, these are the agents only approved to be used during pregnancy, but as a thyroid should not exceed 2 mg per kilogram dose, and also corticosteroids should not exceed 20 grams per day. When it comes to the pharmacokinetics changes during pregnancy, it's noted that we will have to make 20 to 25% dose elevation of, C of cyclosporin due to uh, the hyperactivity of cytochrome system during pregnancy and also the large volume of distribution. Uh, the, um, the higher levels are noted during the first and second trimester, so we recommend doing bi-weekly uh, levels during the first and second trimester. Uh, Tacrolimus, on the other hand, as we can see in this study, will exhibit a different pharmacokinetics profile. As we all know, tacrolimus is uh, distributed within the plasma into the erythrocytes, lymphocytes, and BART will be bound to the plasma protein, and the free fraction uh, part is the one responsible for the pharmacological action. As you can see, the trough hole level will be reflective of the concentration of tacrolimus in all of these compartments. However, if a pregnant fe female patient uh, 
uh, who have uh, hypoalbuminemia and anemia, the trough level will be misleading and it will be lower. As a consequence, the physician may increase the dose of the drug, leading to an increase of the free fraction and endangering the female patient of adverse events. So we do not, we recommend do not adjust the dose unless the concentration fall by more than 50% or it fall below the lower limit of the clinical assay. Also, uh, tacrolimus cyclosporin, azathioprine, ARS, and steroids are acceptable to be used during lactation, and BNF recommends waiting at least four hours after the administration to minimize exposure, and the national, international trend nowadays encourages lactation. However, we still restrict it for our patients. Also, there is a difficulty in administering the drugs to uh, transplant patients on mechanical ventilation. So we provided this protocol of preparing and administering the drugs. It's very important to note that we have to stop the enteral feeding one hour before and two hours after the administration of the drugs. Also, there is a very important question. Are generic immune suppressants safe and effective to be used? Uh, those in favor of this argument base it, base it on the fact that these drugs are very, uh, cost uh, uh, little money. And also the using USA market has increased from 19% in 1984 to 75%. However, the party who is against the use of generic immune suppressants based their argument on the potential for organ rejection. And also, these drugs have been approved by agencies using outdated bioequivalent standards. And also, there is lack of quality data supporting bioequivalence in children. However, in my institute, we do not recommend using uh, generic immune suppressants, and we use the innovative ones for our transplant patients. Also, uh, the most important part of our clinical practice is patient education in order to improve adherence. We have to identify the areas related with non adherence like socioeconomic status, patient-related, or factors related to the healthcare setting and provider. We have to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with the patient, tell him the importance of sticking to his regimen, and also telling him if he experienced any adverse events, he has to seek medical advice and go with him with the, the protocol and when to take the medications and things like that. And thank you.